This is Michael Woodward, and this is episode 93 of the Jumble Thing Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Jumble Thing Podcast, a podcast focused on telling the stories of dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers. Along the way, we give you some tips and ideas of how you can chase your own big ideas and dreams and create the world you want to live in. Our guest on today's episode is Jeffrey Shaw. More about Jeffrey in a moment. Our guest on Wednesday's episode is Whitney Nicely. Whitney is a real estate broker and coach. She's also a speaker. Since 2016, she has trained hundreds of future real estate investors to grow their portfolio, collect checks, and achieve financial freedom. She's been featured on Realtor.com, Atlanta CW69, U.S. News, Entrepreneur on Fire, ABC6, and the Real Estate Journal. It is a super fun episode, so make sure to check out our episode with Whitney Nicely this Wednesday. It is hard to believe, but we are nearly at episode 100 of the Jumble Think Podcast. Super excited about all the incredible guests we have and season two, which is coming up in 2018. I want to make sure that if you've been a longtime listener or if you're new to the Jumble Think Podcast, that you never miss another episode and you can go back and check out some of our great Yes. So we're going over to jumblethink.com, click those buttons to your favorite place to listen to a podcast, follow us, and subscribe. Now let's jump into today's episode with Jeffrey Shaw. Hey there, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Jumble Think Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Woodward. Super excited to have you along for today's guest. Our guest today is Jeffrey Shaw. He is a podcast host, business coach, speaker, and for over 30 years, he has been a portrait photographer. His work has appeared on places like Oprah, CBS News, O Magazine, People Magazine, New York Family Magazine, and some of his articles have even been featured on the Huffington Post. Jeffrey is also the host of the very popular Creative Warriors podcast. Recently, he wrote a book called Lingo, Discovering Your Ideal Customer's Secret Language and Make Your Own Business Irresistible. Super cool book, and we dive into the whole concept of speaking your ideal customer's language, and instead of marketing to them or selling to them, really being able to dive into a conversation, speaking their language, and communicating the way they want to be talked to. You can swing on over to jeffreyshaw.com slash jumble to learn more about him, and we'll have that link along with other links in the episode notes. So let's join our conversation with today's guest, Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey, how are you doing today? I'm awesome, Michael. How are you doing? A little sick, so for those (laughs) who listen often, they're going to notice that my words sound a little different. My voice sounds a little weird, and... For that, I apologize, and hopefully I won't stumble through words that my nose uh, knocks out the letters in them. So (laughs) (laughs) it is so good to have you on the podcast. I've uh, been diving into your book, which we're going to talk about. Super excited about that book and talking about that. You've been on a journey, though, and you're you're writing this book from your last couple years of experience, but you didn't start – by being a business coach or a speaker or um, even a podcast host, mm-hmm. your journey starts much before that in the world of photography. Mm-hmm. When did your passion for photography start? You know, it's uh, it's always been there, I guess. You know, I mean, I was a little kid. We, we, my father played with it as a hobby. So there's a dark room in the house. So I first was intrigued by the chemicals, you know, okay. back in the day when we had dark rooms, the mixing <laughs> of chemicals made stuff. But then I ran out of stuff to print. So I started shooting. Um, so it just sort of evolved. Uh, I came from a family that we never they never talked about higher education or direction or it was just sort of like. I don't know that they knew I was around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people collapse under too much pressure for your parents. I actually wish I had a little pressure because <laughs> there was no direction. Um, and so, you know, I had no career direction whatsoever. And I think because of that, though, it actually brought out a natural sense of entrepreneurship for me. Um, I started selling eggs door to door when I was 14 years old. I lived in a country town and so I sold eggs door to door. And I just tried to figure out how do I find my own way? So I started out as a, a photographer. I went to photography school, which was only a 10-month program because I still didn't understand how that could be a career. 
Um, I was good at it. I was very good at photographing people and it caught on pretty quickly. I mean, I got a lot of awards and accolades uh, early on uh, as a 20 year old or so and then uh, finished education and, and went into business as a professional portrait photographer, 20 wow. years old. And, uh, you know, a few years of struggle ended up photographing you know, the, the most affluent families in the United States photographing their their families and their children and that their vacation homes and yachts and going on their European vacations and doing their family portraits. And um, so, uh, you know, it, yeah, most definitely a journey, a journey from, you know, uh, in so many ways, you know, on, on one hand, growing up very little lower middle class, but ending up photographing the wealthiest people in the United States, going from choosing photography as a, a hobby because it removed me from the world. It kept me in, you know, I was extremely shy all the way up into my mid twenties. So it kept me safe from the world. I could hang out in a dark room and you could hide behind a camera, but then, you know, I was good at something. So next thing I know I was on the stage, right? I was suddenly <laughs> being thrown forward, um, you know, mid twenties going to a list or Christmas parties wow. for clients of wealthy people and politicians and celebrities. And, um, so yeah, it's most definitely been a journey. And along the way, the biggest journey of all, I guess you could say is that I made, you know, I, I made a super successful business out of something that probably never should have been, you know, I mean, there's no logical reason to be successful at the level I was as a, one person portrait photographer. Yeah. And uh, so the journey became people started coming to me. Well, how did you do that? So I started coaching photographers uh, on my techniques. And then that, of course, unfolded to realizing this has nothing to do with photography. This is about the journey I've been on is figuring out how to turn any what I refer to as an uncommon entrepreneur, like how to turn any business out of the ordinary into something successful, because it requires a whole different. It's not a transactional experience. It's a very relational based business. And that's what I excel at. And that's the basis of the book lingo. That's that's the ideas. Uh, this book, although just, you know, just coming out, uh, the fact matter is it's the story of my life. I just didn't, it was so close to me. I didn't know it. I didn't see wow. it until, uh, through enough conversations, I realized this is what I need to teach. Well, you mentioned there that one of the things about photography is, and, and even in how you talked about as a child growing up in your family, you talked about, you were kind of always unnoticed, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, you're behind the camera. So people, you try to blend in, you try to disappear. So people feel natural in a lot of those settings. You... Are a child and you feel like, you know, do they even know that I'm here sometimes? That kind of thing. <laughs> and now you've been in this journey of pivoting into the limelight, if you will, where people are seeking you out. They're asking these questions, uh, whether it's about photography or whether it's even about the message and how you market and communicate. How has that changed your perspective of your own value? Hmm. Love, yeah, love the question. Yeah, and in my own and in my own mind, I'm still not visible, right? That's the thing, right? I still carry the old baggage. I still think I'm invisible. You know, not entirely. I can see evidence that you know I get noticed. But that that's it's such a great question, Michael, because um, in my podcast, Creative Warriors, uh, at, at the end, I do a series of four discovery round questions, and the first question is always the same. The other questions change up, but the first question is the same, which is what drives you crazy. And I ask that of my guests because it's always it's predictable to hear how what drives people crazy with a problem they want to solve in the world very closely relates to the the journey they're on yeah. and the path that they chose the career that they chose and so my you know what what drives me crazy is seeing people put in boxes okay. particularly entrepreneurs the fact that you know what drives me crazy is seeing creative people and entrepreneurs given really bad old fashioned niche marketing type of business advice that no longer works and it doesn't work for anybody that thinks outside the box people that think outside the box you don't want to put into the niche box so it what drives me crazy is that that this you know the way people are put into a, a box so it's it is so my my objective, if you, if you will, as a business coach is to help businesses be more visible. And I want the whole point of lingo is to help entrepreneurs build a business that is highly visible to their ideal customer. So it's the exact same thing. It's like while I have this fear, if you will, or you know this this uh, this feeling of being invisible, I'm trying to solve that in other people. And that's where the satisfaction comes. So the satisfaction comes from making my my coaching clients and the people that will read Lingo, helping them be highly visible, of course, is deeply satisfying to me because it's almost self-healing. 
That's really, really cool. You were talking about, you know, niches and, and that traditional uh, exploration of marketing by going into and saying, you know, this is my little space that I've carved out. Uh, this is my niche within a bigger uh, bucket, within a bigger bucket, within a bigger bucket. And you also talk a lot about the evolution of avatars as we've identified our ob- audience. And one of the things that stood out to me as I uh, looked through your articles on Huffington Post or read your uh, book overview and different things like that was that um, you don't just look at people as avatars. Part of your story, which fascinated me, was instead of defining your avatar, you experienced your avatar Mm -hmm. when you were 23 going to New York City in that world of photography, trying to find out how you could stand out and create a business out of this. Can you tell us the story of when sure. you were 23 and and how experiencing your avatar instead of defining your avatar has helped set you up on the, the trajectory you're on today? Beautiful. Thank you. So, you know, and, and so much of it is actually said in the subtitle of the book, which I'll just recite and then I'll explain the story. So this the, the book is, you know, of course, called Lingo. But the subtitle is Discover the Secret Language of Your Ideal Customer and make your business irresistible. So it's this idea of secret language that I tapped into on that journey, that visit into New York City that you're speaking of. So, and again, here I was 23 years old. I'm now 53. So we're looking at 33, 30 years later. Wow. Uh, and it was just a year or so ago that uh, I actually had written another book last year. I spent all of last year writing another business book, which never got published because when it was done, it, it, just didn't feel like the book that I was meant to put out. And I knew it and I felt it. And the editor I was working with at the time felt it. So I wound up just, you know, putting it aside for a little bit, not knowing what I was going to do with it and wound up getting into a conversation with another another editor who immediately picked up on the story I'm going to share with you in a minute. And she said, that's the story you need to tell. And those are the lessons that entrepreneurs need. And I realized that it was the story of my life that I've lived that was so close in front of me that I couldn't see it until somebody else pointed it out. So what happened was I had, you know, when I, when I got out of photography school and I went back, I went back to my hometown. Now, mind you, as a photographer, I had, I had this idea that how important it was to be a portrait photographer, that being a portrait photographer and and family portraits and children were, you know, incredibly valuable and people needed to hold on to them and hand them down from generation to generation. So I placed a very high value of importance on this. So was going to try to charge amount of money that was proportionate to how important I felt it was. And unfortunately, the town in which I grew up in, I was trying to build this business in, it was very lower, you know, lower middle class town. And and as one woman said to me, I don't have the luxury of worrying about my children's memories. I don't know how I'm paying my rent. Yeah. Right. So I realized that I was I was, in fact, speaking the wrong language. I was speaking the language of long term and high values uh, for handing things down to people that were worrying about today. So that let me know as like, well, all right, well, I need to I need to speak to people. I need to market my business and my services to people that can afford luxury. And who are they? Well, they're they're affluent people. Problem was, I know nothing about affluence yeah. at that point in my life. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. So I went to the one place that I could think of. And I, I to this day, I can't remember how I heard about it, but it's Bergdorf Goodman on Fifth Avenue, New York City. Yeah. You know, Bergdorf Goodman is a, it's a, you know, it, you know, you're a New Yorker. It's a, it's yeah. a one of a kind department store, seven, seven stories high and there's nothing else. There's nothing else like it. And it's right in the smack of fifth Avenue and 95% of people that are on fifth Avenue walk right by it and don't even notice it. They don't notice it because it's not for everybody. And right. that's the point, right? So, <laughs> but I, somehow I knew the store was there and I said, well, I'll go there. So I go to this store with this idea, to your point, I was going to experience my clients, what I understood, you know, it's an important lesson in business to in life to to really acknowledge what we don't know. And what I what I knew that I didn't know was anything about what it meant to be rich. Yeah. So I felt it wasn't enough to know the demographics, the profile, blah, 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 all that boring stuff, because if it's boring to me, it's gonna be boring to the consumer. So I was like, well, what I need to know is, you know, how do they think? What's their perspective, which in lingo, I teach a five step process to understanding and building the secret language brand of your customers, your ideal customer. So step number one is perspective. So I went to Bergdorf Goodman to understand the perspective of my ideal customer, who I wanted to be my ideal customer. And what I found is that it was a world unlike anything I had seen because I had never been around that. But I realized not only is it a world, it's one thing to be in a place that's not, you know, familiar to you. It's different to you. It's another thing to realize that there's a whole different, like, wavelength going on there that this business knows how to speak to their customer 
and I didn't. Yeah. So the the grounding story, the entire so the crazy thing about Lingo, I think, as a book is that I'm writing it now, but it's literally based on on one afternoon, thirty years ago, <laughs> when I learned what I what I, when I realized what I learned, and then built all my businesses and other people's businesses on this one principle that I learned in this one afternoon. Key turning point moment was in the store. I only had, by the way, I had twenty bucks with me. That's the, you know, I was a poor kid. All I had was twenty bucks with me. I was terribly inappropriately dressed. And I look back now, I'm surprised they didn't escort me out of the store. Wow. In hindsight, I kept thinking when I was walking around and realized how inappropriately dressed I was, I was hoping that they thought I was some rich heir yeah. who could get a, who could get away looking like this. Yeah. <laughs> so the only thing I could afford was this tiny candle, like this votive candle, really, really small. Because it was under 20 bucks plus sales tax, I could get by with 20 bucks. And yeah. I asked for it to be gift wrapped because I really wanted to understand the whole process. Like, what did it feel like to be a customer here? And I observed how, you know, the salesperson was completely not judgmental about who I was. Assuming she couldn't figure it out. She couldn't figure out if I was a poor kid who didn't belong here. Was I a rich heir who, you know, so absolutely no judgment. She hand treated me like I was worth a million bucks, even though I was buying a $20 item. Wow. And when I asked for it to be gift wrapped, she escorted me to gift wrap. I mean, I went in there feeling like I don't belong and wound up feeling like a million bucks. Wow. Right, which already told me a lot. Non-judgment. Um, you know, just everybody got handled you know, without judgment and, and top service, I was escorted over the gift wrap department and I asked for it to be wrapped. This woman was in the gift wrap department was behind like this, this hole in the window. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the wall. Right. So I said, you know, would you show me how to gift wrap this? And I said, yeah, I actually said to her, I'm trying to learn what rich people like. Will you yeah. show me how to gift wrap it? And she laughed. She <laughs> brought me into the back room. So she's wrapping this thing, but she's putting it in tons of tissue paper putting it into Bergdorf Goodman's signature silver metallic box. Yeah. And she wraps it up with purple ribbon, again, also their signature color. And then she, she stops with the most dramatic pause, Michael, that you could imagine. She looks up at me and she says, don't use any tape. Okay. No, exactly. <laughs> That's my, I was like, okay, why is that important? And, you know, meanwhile, I'm thinking, God, my family, we wrap Christmas presents with newspapers and duct tape. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, what do you mean don't use any tape? And I, so I said, why? And she said, well, because this client is very, very particular, right? So she, the customer is going to want to untie the ribbon, take off the box top, unfold all the tissue paper, make sure the candle is perfect before she gives it as a gift, put it all back together. And, and you can't tell that it was opened. Wow. And wow. I, that's when I, that's when I, in that moment I made the, uh, the observation and coined the term secret language. I was like, holy cow, that's like a secret language that you would never know unless you are in sync with who you're serving, yeah. your ideal customer. Yeah. It's the simplest thing. But then I started, you know, then, then my whole world unfolded because not only at Bergdorf's, but then I spent months studying what it meant in how, you know, what the perspective of was the affluent clientele. And I started notice, noticing how things were merchandised in a very clean way. There was, there could be volume, but everything was so innately organized. Uh, brand names, of course, or designer names were, you know, everything. Designer names made everything look really expensive. My business wasn't in my name at that time. I immediately changed my photography business to being in my name. Um, the pricing psychology was astonishing to me because I grew up in an environment where everything was priced down to the hundredth of a cent, you know, 1497 and yeah. you know, 1999. And, yeah. um, you know, and I really, in the store like this, every, the prices are all rounded off. Yeah. It's just $50, $500, $5,000, right? Yeah. Just to say the crazy, I think my, the most fun observation I made, Michael, was that in a high end store, you can't find a cash register. Right. The cash registers are like hidden behind merchandise. They're in back rooms. And I think that's really interesting in stores where you're spending the most amount of money, the transaction is less obvious. Whereas you walk into Walmart or Target, the first thing you see is a huge lineup <laughs> of registers right. at the door. Yeah. And I realized that the, 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 the different language is that if you're a price conscious business, if your business model like Walmart, which is to draw forward, speak the language of cost conscious consumers, if that's your language, then you want to make the you want to draw a lot of attention to the price. Yeah. You want to have rollback. You want to run entire ad <laughs> campaigns about rollback prices. Right, right. Make the registers obvious. You know, if you're in the high end, you don't want to talk about it. It's all very vague because it's that's not what it's about. It's not about the transaction of money. It's about the experience. Yeah. And everything in between that, every business, Target, Walmart, uh, you know, every every business you can think of, 
if they're doing it right, they are speaking the secret language of the people they want to draw forward. And I realize, I feel like entrepreneurs of small businesses aren't necessarily getting this message. I'm not saying big businesses are doing it right either. Some are, some aren't. But I think this is, it's absolutely critical for entrepreneurs and small businesses to get this because as we move forward in the world of business and in our world in general, it is going to be required. I think people, consumers are going to require that we know a lot more about them than their demographics and profile. We have to know their hearts and their souls before we can get into their pockets. Right. They're going to demand a higher standard of personal interaction because, and we, you know, we do remember, Michael, we're consumers too. We're experiencing the world that's far more automated and robotic. Yeah. And as the pendulum swings that way, the pendulum's also going to swing the other way where people are going to want more personal interaction. And that's that's what I mean about speaking the secret language, this idea of lingo, really getting into people's lingo so that they feel like you really get them. One of the things in your book that you talk about is the new niche. Mm. Yeah. And, and it fascinated me because there's a couple buzzwords that you use, but you've spun them. Avatar is one of them. Uh, secret language is, you know, what language are they speaking? Marketing. But niche is – you know, plastered everywhere. Make sure you you niche down, you niche down. But your interpretation of that is so different. Can you share that with us? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is uh, my, my Twitter profile says forcing fe forcing creative people to focus on one thing blocks creativity. Yeah, right? you know, and I have that, and that's always it's a controversial state. I get a lot of positive, more positive, <laughs> but some negative feedback. People push it, you know. And hey, you know what? Niche marketing, niche thinking works for some people, particularly people that are more logical thinking. Right. The problem is, <laughs> there are far more, I'd say, creative thinking people in business today than than less creative people, thinking people, you know, and, and evidence shows that. I mean, CNN did a, uh, a study that by 2030, 60% of the U.S. economy is going to be uh, based on freelancers, right. independents, entrepreneurs, yeah. right? So, you know, there are far more creative thinking people. So the, the, the old model, the old niche just no longer works. You know, I don't think it's a good business model. The whole idea of find one thing you're good at and one audience that wants that is extremely limiting. I find the whole niche model really stifling. And I've seen it absolutely shut down some people, you know, creative thinkers, people who are multi-passionate and, and can imagine creating a lot of different things. They're miserable if they try to niche down. And and, and I can I can relate to that because for yeah. me – I, I go, yeah, but not everyone's going to fit in this pocket, and right. there's so much more to offer than just going, hey, this is all I focus on. Yeah, and it's not a good business model because if something comes along in the world that takes that specialty away, you're screwed, right? right? It's just not a good business model. So my idea of the new niche is um, – that the niche is actually based on your space, your authority. Like what's your what's your area of authority? Kind of what kind of space can you own? So, uh, you know, for example, for me, I did the classic. Initially, I was coaching photographers. You know, that was my niche. Yeah. But when I when I got there, when I realized my area of my area of authority is not coaching photographers, my area of authority is helping people who are in uncommon businesses be successful. When I realized that, like that's my that's my niche. My niche is my area of authority, and the space that I, and the market that I can own is being the go to expert for people that are in uncommon businesses. When I realized that, it's like, well, that opens up a big door. Now yeah. I can coach other coaches. I can coach podcasters. I can coach, uh, you know, inventors. I can coach designers, jewelry designers, event planners. I coach a huge range of people. What the one thing that I that I find in common with all my clients, all two things actually. One is that they're all in a, an uncommon business. And the second thing is the people that I coach are in a business where there is no business education for it, <laughs> right? There's no business education for being successful as a photographer or a podcaster. We're all just trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's what I mean by the new niche. It's like your, it's your niche, if we're going to call it a niche at all, it's what's your area of authority. And then you can start seeing many more opportunities to create different things and reach different audiences. So now, finally, the, the niche idea is an expansive model instead of a restrictive one. So much of what you're sharing right now is about changing mindsets. And you wrote an article that was really fascinating in the Huffington Post uh, about momentum thinking. And I, I think that a lot of times entrepreneurs, they, 
uh, or creatives or people with big ideas and dreams, they get into the space and, and they, they, they're passionate about it. They bleed it. They love the people that are engaged with it, but they don't feel like they can get the momentum. Can you share a little bit about momentum thinking and how we can pivot and use some of these principles, the five-step process, the new niche process, mm-hmm. and really change the momentum uh, in our favor so we can start having forward trajectory instead of being stagnant? Mm. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, because I actually feel, you know, and again, I, I think I naturally think very conceptually and then try to ground things. So, and I think it's important for a lot of us to think that way. And I think it's important for entrepreneurs to think that way too, because a lot of it, so much of success does come down to mindset. You know, it, uh, on Creative Warriors, my podcast, our, our tagline, if you will, is business with a soul. Yeah. Because I, I immediately want to capture that that essence that it's it's not an, an either or mentality. And I think, and I tried doing this with Lingo too. Lingo is by and large a book of strategy. It's a book about building the strategy of secret language to work with your ideal customers. And two thirds of the book speaks to that. The last third of the book is basically mindset and daily practices that actually get you the results you want. Because I, I, what happens a lot of times is, and I think this is where a lot of people get stuck and they lose momentum is, and I refer to it in the, uh, in the book, I refer to uh, it a lot about like being on the hamster wheel. Yeah. Some people say treadmill. Yeah. And I think one of the big blocks to momentum is and it, it, it's it's a tough thing to say because I believe in action <laughs> and I want to make sure I make that clear like right. you, nothing happens till you take action so I don't want to I'm not I don't believe in the movie the secret and manifesting <laughs> and those things work but you know this is not a woo woo conversation right. entirely right I believe in action but here's a big problem Michael and I've been observing this for decades that a lot of people get so busy being in action and working really hard, but they're hardly getting anywhere. And that's the hamster wheel. And what I realized that, you know, when you're working really hard, you're actually pushing up against a wall, that there are things internally that you have to unblock and create better practices of, of positive flow in your life so that the action that you take gains momentum. Right. So, and actually the whole, the whole final third of the book is about some of these daily practices and just mindsets, changing the way you think. Some of it is very practical. Like one of the things in momentum thinking that that I, uh, I I talk about is to think vertically about the things that you do. And I again, creative thinkers, and I don't just mean creative artists, but creative thinkers tend to tend to create horizontally, meaning we create, we complete, we move on. We create, we complete, we move on. What I think a good way of, of changing the momentum of your thinking is for everything that you accomplish, ask yourself if there are minimally three more things you can do with that content. Okay. Right. So, for example, even for, on my podcast, one of the suggestions I make to my podcast guests, and I, I'm happy to you know provide them the recording, but of course they can wait till the recording comes out. I suggest they have it transcribed. Yeah. A lot of us as guests say things on interviews that are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I hear my guests all the time say, I've never said that before. Yeah. You know, a lot of my guests have said, wow, you know, I wish I, I can you write that down? I wish I remember that. So I, <laughs> a lot of times I'll tell you, it's like, don't just go on an interview, be interviewed and can close the door and be done with it. Right. When you're interviewed, have it transcribed. There's probably your next book in there. There's probably wow. more content. That's part of my idea of momentum thinking is that, you know, like everything that I do, momentum thinking, the, the concept of momentum thinking is both changing your your internal self so that you're unblocking yourself from whatever's holding you back and, from, and keeping on the hamster wheel. And at the same time, being strategic for every action you take, can you compound that by thinking of three ways of applying it so that you're not, you know, you're not reinventing the wheel all the time. You're, you're re-leveraging everything that you do. That's really, really good. And, and I think that so often when we're in business, and, and, and we hear this all the time. We're working in our business, not on our business. But I think one thing you said there that's really powerful is sometimes the roadblock is eternal, I- internal. It's not just a roadblock of business. Sometimes it's a process or a belief or something inside of us that we have to work through to get to the next phase, the next piece of the strategy, the me- next moving uh, forward to keep the, the the business going in a direction that's growing and not just being what it always has been. Yeah, most definitely. I actually think, 
You know, I actually said to one of my coaching clients this morning, because uh, I was 10 minutes late calling her, and which is very unusual for me. I'm an incredibly punctual guy, and I was running a little, so I sent, her, I sent her a text ahead of time, so I'm going to be 10 minutes late. But when I got on the phone with her, I want her to understand why, because I felt there was a learning lesson in it for her. Yeah. I said, you know, uh, you know, my book recently went on pre-sale, and it brought up fears for me. I'm going to acknowledge that, you know, it's out there now. My first <laughs> book is now out in the ethos. It's like, yeah. what if everybody hates it? What, you know, <laughs> all these fears came up. I said, I had to acknowledge that. So I said to her, I said, so I realized this morning I need to, I need to up my practices. I need to like amp up my, my daily practices. So in doing that, it took me a little longer to get myself uh, to the point of being able to call her today. And so I had said to her, I said, you know, what I want you, you to hear that and as a lesson is that when I'm having business problems, I almost always turn to what's going on on the inside first. Yeah. Right. So I don't look at how do I, because I, this is where you get stuck on the hamster wheel. If you keep solving your business problems with more effort, more work, more hours, you're working really hard and hardly getting anywhere. If you turn in, tier, in you know, internally and look at, well, what can I do to, you know, unblock or create more flow? And, and my biggest if, if you don't mind, I'll take a second to explain. Like my yeah. biggest, uh, and I teach this on lingo. It's in the very last chapter about the daily practices. A, a life-changing practice for me has been what I call a what's going right journal. Yeah. And I teach this in the book. And the what's going right journal, it's different than a gratitude journal. Because honestly, gratitude journals never worked for me. Because I'm grateful for everything. I'm grateful for breathing. I'm grateful for the good weather. I, I don't know how to do anything with that. <laughs> so it just wasn't tangible enough for me. It, yeah, didn't, it for didn't have a direct result. Yeah. And I'm a result oriented guy. So I started the what's going right journal, where I acknowledge what's going right in my life. Because, you know, inherently, we humans often focus on what's wrong. You know, it's, you can hear 10 compliments, one criticism, you're going to remember the criticism. So, you know, we do that throughout the day, we start focusing on what's not going right more than what's going right. And I want to create positive flow. So today I needed to spend more time acknowledging more things that are going right. And then at first you're like, oh, well, this is going right. That's and then you're like, oh, but this too. Oh, yeah. And then this is going right. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah. That's the point. That's what actually creates tangible results in your life is when you start acknowledging more of what's going right. Guess what you see, Michael? Uh, breakthroughs and uh, possibilities. You see more of what's going right. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, when you start acknowledging what's going right, you start seeing more of what's going right. So yeah. that's what I mean by, you know, it's so often, if not every time, if I want business results, I look inward first as to not only how I can unblock what could be blocking it, but also literally how I can create a positive flow inward. The what's going right journal that I teach in Lingo has been my my game changer. It has been the one, it's given me such tangible results. Um, it's, it's awesome. You know, and we all know this philosophy, honestly, in some deep level, we all know the philosophy because somebody can tell you about a movie or a book you never heard of. And then suddenly you'll see it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It, it happens. I don't care to really figure out the psychoanalysis of why it works, <laughs> <laughs> but Hey, why not leverage that in business? If yeah. you start acknowledging what's going right and start seeing more of what's going right, your business is more successful. For sure, it, it, and it's that living place, living in that place of gratitude, that seems to bring more joy to us. Because when we're living there, it's just we're more fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, and and at the end of the day, and I think that's again, if you look at the way society changes, we're not looking for quali quantity of hours; we're right. looking for quality of life. Right. And, you know, that's why that's why I, this a book like Lingo is really important to me. It's why I included the self-help area in the back, because I, I just really didn't want to put out another book that caused people to work harder because there's so many <laughs> strategies in it that need to be applied. Yeah. You know, I wanted to make sure I got I help people get off that loop, because at the end of the day, I think, you know, the millennials, I have three millennials and I look at the way they live. I look at, uh, you know, what the future generations want. We want quality of life over quantity of hours. Yeah. Um, so let's build our lives and, our, and make the changes in our, our lives and our businesses that help us improve our quality of life and get us off of the quantity of hours that we spend at work. I'm going to pivot a little bit here um, and focus on two elements of the new niche that you brought up. And, and I think it applies to the five steps. It applies to so many of the different things you're talking about. And I'm going to kind of combine these a little bit. So give me a second here to, to process through this. Uh, <laughs> I... I grew up in – I was born in 1981. I grew up in between two generations. Don't really fit in with the Gen X. Don't really fit in with millennials. Uh, there are terms for it called the, the um, 
but you're the still lucky loved, ones. Michael. What's that? <laughs> you're still loved, Michael. <laughs> I, I, I do believe I feel I feel very loved. Uh, but w- some people call it the lucky ones because we got to experience technology and a life without technology as we know it today. We got to experience the evolution of stuff. One of the things you talk about is creating a place where you belong, and mm-hmm. and I think that. For me, you know, I've experienced where I go, I don't really fit in here. And even how some of the ways I think are different because of my experiences of not being completely pre-technology in my adolescence and not being uh, really post-technology like a lot of people are as we have it involved in our life. And so I get this, and I've talked to other people in the same generation space as I am and, and that sense of belonging. One of the things you focus on that I think belonging really goes with it well is that we need to move away from building audiences and building a place of community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so powerful because we hear it all the time. You know, what's your audience want to hear? What do you need to say to them? Who's your audience and all that kind of stuff. And in a world with social technologies that bring social communities, there seems to be uh, less and less authentic community, if you will. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of building community and how you can create a place to belong? Yeah, I, I love that you're collapsing these two things uh, so beautifully. They're two different parts of the book and two entirely different parts of the book, but I love the way you're collapsing them um, because they, they do tie in nicely together and you may have just you may have just you know changed some things for me. <laughs> um, but I love the fact that you're able to make that connection because uh, there's kind of a pain and solution to it. You know, the pain right. is so many people don't feel like they belong. And it has always been one of my observations. And so in the in in the book Lingo, I refer to this as the validation paradox. Uh, and it's actually honestly the concept was originally crafted for what I hope will be a TEDx talk. Oh, cool. Uh, so I, and I, which I haven't done yet. I've applied to a couple, but, um, this is really, you know, it's, it's something I wanted. It's my big idea. It's the big idea I wanted to put out into the world, this idea of a validation paradox, because I think it is a paradox that we've been, we've been led that to, We've been led to believe that we have to validate who we are on our own. We've been led right. to believe that we have to figure out our own why, our own purpose, our own authenticity. And what I realized is that, you know, that's what creates this this sense of loneliness and not belonging. And I think in, innately, a lot of creative thinking people, people with the biggest minds and solutions and biggest ideas in the world, uh, which is a, a requirement for human evolution, we're often born into environments, our families and our communities, that we are – the, the paradox is that we feel less than because we feel different, mm-hmm. and yet we actually are probably more evolved in thinking than the people around us. Like we are the – we're just naturally born with this big ideas and this creative way of thinking, and yet we end up feeling like we're less than because we're different than the people around us. And without – Getting out of that, there's the there's there. It's possible, if not likely, that some great potential will be lost. What I found that the, the this validation paradox is recognizing that the paradox of that and the sense of community is that if in fact that's your if you're starting from that perspective that you are you know less than and and your expectations of yourself are limited, then you in fact can't reach your full potential because expectations by definition you have predetermined what you're capable of. Right. The only way to get beyond your own self-imposing limitations is to find a community of people who see more in you than you see in yourself or a community of people that can uh, pull out the best in you. It's actually, you know, in an unobvious way, it's actually the basis of the book Lingo. By speaking the secret language of your ideal customer, you work with the people who are your peeps. They're your community. You work with the people that you are meant to serve. They innately bring out the best in you. I believe it's the true foundation of the whole idea of success breeds success. When you get, you know, when you get into the company of your ideal customer, they see and expect the best in you and you rise to that occasion. You find more in yourself. Next thing you know, you're getting better at what you do. You're serving them even deeper. You understand who they are and what makes them tick and their secret language even more, which deepens the relationship, which makes you even better at what you do. And it just goes on and on. And you wind up achieving, as I did, levels in your life that would have been unimaginable to you from your limited ability to think about what you're capable of in the beginning. So there's an incredible power. And I tell you, in the middle of writing Lingo, we had the Tony Awards. And because of my awareness of this, I sat there and watched the Tony Awards and every recipient stood before the audience and thanked their peers for helping them be who they are. Wow. 
And next time you watch an award show, notice how many people are acknowledging their success and saying, if it wasn't for my friends, my peers, I never would be who I are, who I am. And when I dug into this, Michael, I realized there's a, there's an African term called Ubuntu. Yeah. You know, and so this way I'm not saying I invented this idea. Like Ubuntu <laughs> in African means I am I because of we. Yeah. Right. So it embraces this idea that we actually validate ourselves through the people that we spend time with. And and working with your ideal customer will make you a better human and r- help you rise to your full potential as a human, which what's the result of that in business? More business. Right. Because you've elevated yourself. You've gotten better at what you do. So it's you know, it's the cycle that's the importance of finding. I think it's, you know, work with your ideal customer is one type of community. And then of course you have your community of peers professionally that helps you be who you are. Now you can look at your own client base no longer as a database, right? You're not building a database. You're not building an email list. When you start looking at your ideal customers as your community, I believe you start taking care of them better. You don't lo- no, you no longer look at them as just an email list. How big's your list? How big's your audience? It's like, how big's your community? Who's your world? How do you take care of them? And I think it's an important mindset for entrepreneurs and small businesses to start looking at their, you know, who they serve as a community. Because I think it raises your level of commitment and responsibility to them than thinking of them as an audience. Well, it's being in it together instead of absolutely. You know, so often it, it, we see this, and, and, and I've talked about it recently with some other guests. Um, you know, the whole NDA culture that says I need to protect what's mine. I need to protect. Uh, my own thing. I got to do it on my own. I've got to make it. It's got to be me. And that whole mindset is really dangerous because it's like, think of what could have been if you would have heard the voice of others and how it could have changed and impacted the the scope of what you did or the impact of what you accomplished and how it changed those around you. And that cohesion of community in ideas is such a birthing place for breakthroughs that we never could have imagined you know and and i think that we need to be creating that kind of culture more instead of you know i'm going to i'm going to get mine and forget everyone else you know yeah 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 i think it's uh like i said when i when i started looking at my business from the perspective is i am i because of we yeah i start i felt much a much deeper kinship with my customers Right, that I am who I, I I am as successful as I am because of you. It's beyond gratefulness. It's beyond gratefulness for their business. It's now giving them credit for helping you be who you are. And like I said, to me, just what can result from that or what does result from that is just a much deeper bond, which I think is going to be a requirement moving forward in business that we're not going to be able to just get by just knowing people on a surface level. They're going to want to feel like you really get who they are. Yeah. I've said it for years with the web development company that I've owned that the moment I stop loving a client is the moment that I either there's something wrong with me or I can no longer work with them because I can't serve them to the fullness that they deserve. Yeah. Good point. Great point. As we kind of move towards the end of today's episode, I want to take a moment and make sure that people know how they can connect with you, how they can find your book, which is coming out uh, soon, which is super exciting. And, you know, if they're really resonating with what they're saying, how they can reach out and maybe start the conversation with you. Awesome. I'd love it. Well, we've actually put together a, uh, a special gift, a Lingo Media Kit, which uh, I'm really excited about. I think it's going to contain uh, things that your listeners will love. So in the Lingo Media Kit uh, is a secret language infographic, which takes the five steps of understanding and building the secret language for your business and creates it as a visual. Great thing to hang on the wall or keep for yourself. Uh, in the Lingo Media Kit includes a free chapter, to read. But then what I'm even more excited about uh, being a podcaster is that there is an audio (laughs) version of the free chapter, which is totally cool because it's unlike any other audio version. There's sound effects, there's (laughs) music. uh, And I even go, I even break the wall and tell some, a little more about the story than what's in the book. Because, you know, a book is from such mass, uh, mass uh, distribution, you know, you want to play it safe. But in the recording, I'm like, no, I'll, I'll give a little more insight here. So there's actually more content in the audio version, which makes it a lot of fun. So the Lingo Media Kit, we've actually created a page, uh, especially for you guys at uh, Jumble Think. So the way to get it is go to jeffreyshaw.com forward slash jumble. And uh, they can go ahead and grab the Lingo Media Kit for free. And we'll make sure to have those in the episode notes. And also, uh, again, in the outro, so that if you missed it, 
you can still find it, and I would highly recommend checking this out. Uh, I've been able to see a little bit of pre-release of some sections of of Jeffrey's book, and um, for me, there were a lot of things that were aha moments. There were a lot of things that I just went and said, I really resonate with that. I haven't heard anyone else say it, but it's something I felt. And it just validates, and you know, there, there it is again. That validation. Uh, uh, what did you call it? The validation. Validation paradox. Paradox of going. Oh, I'm not crazy. So I highly recommend checking it out, and we'll make sure to have those links in the episode notes and uh, in the intro and outro too. So if you've missed it, check it out there. Let's dive into our rapid fire questions, and typically our rapid fire questions follow a format where we have. Six questions we ask every guest. I'm throwing in a wild card one today because today I get to ask one of my favorite questions to ask guests when appropriate. You lived in New York City for a long time. It's my favorite place in the world. I love it. Uh, I, I love Manhattan. It's, it's the place that I think uh, nothing else rivals in the world. You lived in New York. Can you give us one or two places that people have to go and check out in the city when they go there? Absolutely. So let's see. You got to go to the High Line. Of course, that's a, probably a pretty common uh, suggestion. Yeah. But the High Line Park is amazing. I love everything about it. And now I'll tell you about a restaurant that a lot of people don't know about and even New Yorkers don't know about. And yet it's fabulous. I love it. So it's called Robert NYC. It's on the, uh, oh, gosh, is it ninth floor of the uh, Museum of Art and Design, which oh, is right okay. in Columbus Circle. Do, yeah. do you know of it? Probably not, right? I don't know about the restaurant. I know Columbus Circle. I know that exactly. uh, you Everybody got knows jazz at Lincoln it. Center there and everything like yep. that. Well, there's this wonderful restaurant tucked in on the ninth floor called Robert NYC. Uh, they have a fantastic Sunday brunch with live jazz music, uh, but they also have breakfast, you know, lunch, dinner. It's all great uh, and incredible views of Central Park. You're, you're sitting in, wow. at the window looking straight up Central Park. Oh, it's my so cool. go-to place. I went every Sunday for brunch, but it's also my go-to place to bring uh, – people visiting so anybody visiting new york and why uh, robert nyc.com is the website i'll definitely be checking that out yeah, it's very awesome. soon uh let's dive into our typical rapid fire questions now the first question is what is one tip you would give someone with a big idea and dream and they simply don't know where to start you know start with knowing you know who are you innately and who who should you serve uh, you know, I think so often we jump right into who's my who's my ideal customer, which is obviously what Lingo is about. But you know, the step before that is whom are you right for? Yeah. What is your innate qualities and uh, and way of being that you're right for? So that you don't have to change yourself to fit anybody. You just want to be who you are, magnify that, and draw forward the people that love you for who you are and what you are capable of doing. What's one change you'd like to see in the world? Oh, uh, I would like to see a. a I'd like to see old business thinking go away. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I want, I want, you know, the most creative people um, who say, I hate the business side. Of course you hate the business side because you're trying to be somebody you're not. <laughs> right. I want people to be who they are and embrace and leverage their creativity and their creative way of thinking. And uh, in this way, we have a world of diverse business practices. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, you know, when I think of legacy, I have three grown kids, can't help but think about them. Um, so I, I want my legacy to be, to be that I had an impact on the world of creative entrepreneurs. I really hope that my legacy is that I that I will be known as having an impact for unleashing uh, people from old business practices and, and creating businesses where they live the quality of life that they, they want to live. They're passionate about what they do and they make the people that they interact with uh, through their business happy. Who or what inspires you? You know, I'll go with what inspires me because there are a lot okay. of people that inspire me. But what inspires me is, I, you know, honestly, I'm a huge fan of architecture. And I actually, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be a photographer or I, I, or or Mike Brady, honestly. Um, <laughs> I thought being an architect, working at home, having a, an attractive wife, I thought that was all ideal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I was torn, architectural photography, and I obviously chose the route of photography, but my love for architecture is there, and somehow I get all inspiration I need. I get inspiration on lines and designs and things like that, but I get inspiration from customer service, and somehow I find all that in architecture. There's just, a, just what's, I don't know, I'm such a lover of architecture that uh, when I need inspiration, I seek out architecture. And, and let it do its thing. What are you currently reading or watching? I am currently reading The Magic of Getting What You Want. Um, okay. 
<laughs> it sounds like something I really want. Um, and I, it's an older book and it was recommended to me, to me by a podcast guest and I wasn't familiar with it. And I read two to three books a week. So it's not often there are books that I don't know about. Um, so I'm actually currently reading that. Watching, <laughs> uh, my favorite thing to watch right now is Will and Grace. So I'm going to be honest. You know, it's okay. you know, everybody needs a good laugh. I love the fact that they're being really raw and and making. Again, I, what I love is that they're willing to to speak outside the box and to say what needs to be said. So that's about all I watch. Otherwise, I don't watch much else. What is one dream that you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? To be a larger platform speaker. Um, I was a well-known speaker in the photo industry. I've done tons of speaking there. I've done some speaking in other entrepreneurial platforms. But, um, you know, my dream and a dream that I I hope comes true by the, the launch of Lingo and, and the platform that is developing is I would like to be a much bigger uh, platform uh, speaker so that I can uh, it's like have the impact I want to have. It's not about ego. I couldn't care less. I'm actually an introvert. I, you know, I go through a lot of anxiety to be on stage, but I love to see the change that I can see in people's faces when I speak. And that's what I thrive on. I thrive on what I see in the audience as I'm delivering my message. So I would like to be a much uh, my dream is to be a much larger platform speaker. Jeffrey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the podcast. I can't wait till the book comes out so I can read the entire book. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for taking time out, sharing your story, and give us, giving us some insights on how, how we can change our businesses and dream on a larger scale. It's been my pleasure, Mike. We have a great show, and uh, I love the concept, so thank you for having me. Once again, I want to thank today's guest, Jeffrey Shaw, for taking time out to share his story. You can swing on over to jeffreyshaw.com slash jumble. That's jeffreyshaw.com slash jumble to learn more about Jeffrey and to check out what's going on with his book. You can also swing on over to jumblethink.com. Check out the episode notes. There's all the links there along with information about his book. On Wednesday's episode, our guest is Whitney Nicely. She's a real estate broker and coach also a speaker. She has spent several years working in the world of investment strategy using real estate. Since 2016, she's trained hundreds of future real estate investors to grow their portfolios, collect checks, and achieve financial freedom. She has been featured on Realtor.com, Atlanta CW, USA News, Entrepreneur on Fire, ABC, and The Real Estate Journal. This episode goes so much deeper than just talking about houses and properties and making them into investments. We spend a lot of the time talking about the larger picture of entrepreneurship and chasing your dreams. It's a super fun episode, so make sure to check that out this Wednesday. Swing on over to jumblethink.com to check out past episodes, catch some great information about how you can chase your big idea and dream, find amazing resources, and of course, links to many of the great places you can listen to the Jumble Think Podcast. It has been an honor to have you along for this episode of the Jumble Think Podcast. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope you've enjoyed it. You've gotten some great wisdom, and now you're going to go out there and chase that big idea and dream and start changing the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.